Mike Crane. On behalf of the Walton Supply Chain Center, we want to thank you for joining our podcast today. Today, it's all about on-shelf availability and the role of RFID at retail. I'm joined by Justin Pattons, who is the Executive Director of the Auburn RFID Lab, and Matthew Russell, who is the Director of the RFID Lab as it relates to retail. Let's get started. Matthew, I want to take this back to you a little bit. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of people on the line who have heard of Auburn before, um, and and they are interested, okay, what does Auburn do exactly? And I, and I get questions all the time. What is ARC? What is ALEC? What is a what is a cycle count? What exactly is a scout app? They, they, they just don't know. So uh, you sent me a couple of slides, maybe, in a, and again, I don't want this to be an Auburn commercial or a presentation, but I think it's really helpful to let the audience know what exactly are the services in the retail sector that uh, that the folks at Auburn do. So Matt, if you wouldn't mind putting up that deck from, for him again, real quick. And if you just walk us through Matthew, what some of the things that uh, that Auburn does for the retail industry. Yeah, sure. And, and Justin, feel free to jump in here at any point uh, to, to say anything, but yeah, I think sometimes people might think, you know, all we do is the, the ARC testing or maybe the supplier certification for uh, some of the retailers out there. But um, there's a lot of different things. And like Justin said, at the end of the day, you know, our number one product is, is students. Um, and, and so there's a lot of different things we focus on. Um, big, broad buckets, I think, would be education, uh, research, and then also implementation support, uh, supporting retailers uh, and brands along their journeys. Um, here, on the, the list that's on the screen is just a few of the different things that, that we um, can, can sort of categorize or group into uh, lab tours, feasibility testing, ARC specs, and, and so on. Um, I don't want to go down the list there, but uh, maybe jump onto the next slide and then um, take a look at some of these. So one of the bigger things that we do is, is called the ARC program. Um, and what that is, is TAG certification. So, so RFID uh, inlay certification, making sure that they meet um, uh, what we call a spec requirement. So given a certain scenario that that tag will perform uh, to the expected uh, performance threshold. And, and so, for example, if, if we have a retail store and, and we have apparel and we've designated, hey, for all of our T-shirts, we want them to have an RFID tag that meets uh, a certain read requirement, then we'll test the RFID tags, the inlays, and make sure that they meet uh, that standard. And then we'll group them into what we call specs. Um, and we use those specs to assign to different products uh, for, for a given scenario. So uh, here's an example on the screen, it's, it's spec N, there'd be a list of tags. And then if your retailer um, has a playbook, it says, hey, for all of these products, uh, you have to use spec N, then you can go choose from that list. And then you have confidence that that tag uh, or that inlay will read to that uh, that rate. So that's a lot of what we do here at the lab. You can see that photo there is, is what we call the chamber. Uh, so that's where we benchmark and, and test the tags uh, for different read environments. And we can really standardize that. All the foam prevents any outside interference uh, and creates a clean test environment there. Go to the next slide. So another big part of what we do is, is called the ALEC program. Um, and that really grew out of a need for retailers to establish confidence that when their suppliers are tagging, that they're doing it the right way. Um, so all that is, is just a sample uh, or a validation program where a supplier would send in samples and then we test it to make sure it meets uh, a retailer's requirement. Uh, so it's encoded correctly. They're using the right tag. It's the right spec. Uh, it's in the right location. And then the, the sizing and all of that. So um, we do that for a lot of suppliers. Most major retailers uh, that are using RFID uh, go through that program, and it really helps build confidence in all the programs that are out there. Because if a retailer is not confident that their suppliers are tagging correctly, then we can't trust the data. Then at the end of the day, it's it's not going to work. We do see some for new brands, like a lot of times brands will look at this and say, "What do I have to do this?" It's like it it's really more of a help them out to make sure that they don't make a mistake. Because what you don't want to do, the worst case is you go out there and you put RFID tags on 5 million units and then you ship them and they're wrong. Okay. Because that's 
fixing that is not just changing wording on a website. Like you have to pull units out of the supply chain and it may be a four or five or six month supply chain to pull all that stuff back out through there. So what we wanted to do is give people a chance to check on the front end. And most people are pretty good at it. We find that if it's a brand new category, it's people that are brand new to RFID, you know, less than 10% of them will make, you know, errors the first time around, but 10%, it's too high if we're trying to get you know good inventory accuracy uh we would rather find out quickly and easily in the less painful way before people make a very expensive uh, uh belly flop yep awesome the next slide matthew oh. just real just real quick on that one this is this is looks like a, a, a little bit of an edge case here but dan from fuji film said you wanted to set a high quality image and video of the product. And I think they took it literally and they sent you a 50 megabyte file and it crashed everything. So the FYI, <laughs> you, you might want to think about th uh -huh. that. This is an edge case. We don't have to work it here, but that, that was a comment that Dan made. I want to make sure we got uh, on, on your radar. Got it. Yeah. Dan, you can reach out to uh, the Alec email uh, or the contact form and they'll, they'll help you out with that. Yep. Awesome. And um, we also have uh, uh, office hours now too, Matthew, don't forget about that. Yep. Um, yeah, we do. Go. So if there's any suppliers on the call uh, or anyone that's interested in the Alex side of things, um, we do have office hours, uh, Q and A's. And I think the link can be found uh, in uh, your retailer's playbook if they're using the Alex program. Mm -hmm. Is it like the office hours of professors? I'll be there from 115 to 119. You may ask me anything you want. Is that one of those kinds? Exactly of what it is. Yeah. Exactly what it is. The volume, <laughs> the volume is real high. Like we're not, not we, there's a few thousand things that come through there uh, a week. And, um, you know, there's a lot of questions and we try to answer everybody's questions as best we could. But uh, it, it, we found out that the volume was high and some of these are a little complex. And um, we were trying to, find a way to communicate more directly with people mm -hmm. rather than just uh, answering emails back and forth. So that's what we Great. set up the office hours. It's awesome. Yep. I think that's, that's been a huge help. It's easier than going back and forth on, uh, on email. Yep. Um, awesome. Another thing that we do is, is field and lab testing and then also data collection. So helping, um, you know, primarily doing research on, on, you know, looking forward, um, different tags that, that could be coming out that are on the horizon, uh, different read environments, doing testing there, and then also helping support uh, different projects with, with field work. Um, so going out and collecting data and then doing some analysis on that data as well. Um, so these are actually some photos of the lab. Uh, we have a mock retail environment in there that we, uh, we use for a lot of different testing. Yeah, let me interrupt you there because you you guys provide a service that I don't think you want to scale everywhere because I think it'd be really hard to do. But we're certainly going to take advantage of that in a study we're going to talk about here in a second, which is literally going into a retailer and doing a cycle count and picking up every garment and saying, "Does it have a tag? Is it encoded correctly? Is it the right tag? Is it you know? Is it everything that it should be?" And then being able to report back to the retailer, hey, for these categories, here was your actual correctly tagged information. And frankly, from a compliance standpoint, here were your biggest issues from a supplier standpoint of what we didn't see get tagged. So is that something that you guys currently make available or is it just because it's so limited because you've got you know so few resources can do this? Yeah, I, I, that's something that we you know make available as part of projects that we take on. Okay. Um, and it, it's important, right? Because if I, if my inventory says I have 10 items, I go out there and scan the store with RFID and I read five items. Well, I need to be for sure that those missing five are, are actually not in the store. Um, and, and the only way to really know that for sure is to go out and count what's in there. And, you know, maybe it doesn't have an RFID tag. Um, there could be a few different reasons why they're not showing up or they're actually not in that store. Um, and so going in, we call that doing an audit. Uh, it's a huge part of what we do to help gather data and uh, drive confidence in, in programs that are uh, being rolled out. Okay. Excellent. Yep. Go to the next slide. So another, uh, another thing that we spend a lot of time on is, is lab demos and then also kind of hand in hand uh, test space there. But we really do want to show people what RFID is, how it works, then what are some of the different use cases uh, that it can be used for. So we have a lot of different groups that come through the lab um, and offer tours as you know, an educational thing um, where they can learn about RFID 
uh, active tags and passive tags, and then really have a conversation to you know see how it might work for them. Um, so anyone on the call, you know, if you are interested in coming to the lab and, and want to see it in person, um, we offer tours and we do those all the time. So uh, feel free to reach out to us. All right, next slide. I think this is the last one here, but a, a huge part of, of what we do too is, is data analysis. And we have a whole team of students that, that work on that, um, both to support existing projects and then also from the research side of, you know, what does the future of uh, supply chain uh, data transfer and data capture look like, uh, especially with RFID. Um, and these are some examples of, of projects and, and things that the team has worked on. Uh, the, the one on the left there that looks a little bit like a, a Petri dish or something, we call that the bubble viz, um, but that's really a way to visualize inventory in a store uh, in the truest way that we can. Um, Cause we say, you know, if I'm 50% accurate, um, that may not be intuitive as far as what that means. And I think there's a few different ways that we can define inventory accuracy. Um, and so we wanted to create a, a way to look at each SKU, look at the magnitude of that SKU, and then also look at uh, whether it's accurate or not from an inventory perspective. Uh, so that's something that the team is, is currently working on um, in developing. And then also there on the right, just some charts, you know, looking at um, RFID that's coming in and sources of shrink. And, um, you know, we do all sorts of stuff and, and really explore a lot of different aspects of, uh, of inventory accuracy. Justin, anything to, to add? No, um, you know, Mike, you really helped us out on that sources of shrink stuff uh, or, um, from the beginning. And, and um, that's a, a key one, uh, making sure that we can know what's coming in, what's going out. It's a it, very quick, interesting example. Um, one of the things we saw in a retailer was uh, like packages of uh, T-shirts. We're looking at like four packs of white T-shirts. And we were looking at the uh, outbound on those. And we were comparing POS to RFID and what left the store. And after two months, it was almost the exact correlation. It was maybe a 1% variance. So what that tells us is people are not stealing a lot of these, you know, four packs of white t-shirts. It's not a high target item. But when we looked at the inbound, oh man, it was a mess because uh, the assortment was off. I mean, everything was weird. Stuff was getting booked in that wasn't coming in. So you say, well, how do we get back down to a low inventory accuracy? Well, uh, we could say how. It's not because people are stealing all of them off the shelf. It's because we're messing up the assortment on the inbound when we replenish. But then if you look at something like uh, uh, TVs, so the inbound assortment's great because you don't misorder or misreceive large volumes of television sets. But the exit, don't look so good because that's a high target theft item. That's something people walk out of the store with, you know, all the time, unfortunately. So what you see is different items in the store have very different behavior because of the different ways people use them and purchase those, but they all combines together to lower inventory accuracy. So we're trying to understand not just how we fix, you know, the current inventory inaccuracy issues, but how do we fix the sources of the problem? We're not just putting a Band-Aid on there. We want to go to the source and understand why the inventory accuracy is getting wrong in the first place, because that's the ultimate goal of all this. Yeah. Yep. hundred percent. I've heard it said, well, RFID, all I'm doing is fixing the things that I lost on a weekly basis or whatever. And it's like, yeah, you are, but you're, you're correcting it, reflecting what you really have. So you could potentially sell more product because that that's the bottom line. And just to build off that, I got a couple of really, I think, really good questions that I want to ask you guys. One is on the use case. Back to you, Justin, really. So I have Bridget asking a question, and you'll laugh at this one. We are RFIT tag all of our products for Walmart, and we ship them complete. They claim a lot of shortages. The item is tagged, but not in the carton. Um, obviously there was a lot of work, uh, with chip. Maybe you spend just a couple of minutes on what chip is, uh, and the, the idea of sharing that data across the supply chain with your suppliers and what the opportunities are for both claims as well as product authentication. Yeah. Claims is a big deal. Um, um, nobody likes claims and I, I don't, I know the, the question was Walmart, but I'm going to broaden it just a little bit because I, okay. I don't want to speak to just Walmart in general, but, uh, okay. there's a, there's a lot of retailers that are using RFID in the store. Um, you know, and uh, some people may not like this, so when I say it, but follow me here when I say this. When we ship stuff through the supply chain, uh, ASNs are aspirational. What that means is that we think that that was what went out in that shipment. And we may even have barcoded some stuff on the dock before it went out through there. But for the most part, most people, and I'm not even talking about suppliers, even the retailers themselves, 
when we make ASNs in the supply chain, that's based on what the order that was generated and what we think was supposed to go out through there. Um, the big change when we moved to RFID world is um, because every single unit has its own unique serial number, we cannot generate any type of movement event or shipment event unless we physically scan that item. So what that means is we have to have a confirmed scan on receipt of that item for there to even be a transition in the supply chain. And that's very powerful because what that means is if you make any you know item movement transition or data transition into a confirmed transition, that's you, you, there's not much room for error there. Like if something disappears between this doc door and the next one, well, you know where it went. So we know where to go look for it. The problem there though is Mike is that that is an exponentially greater amount of data and the responsibility for data handling there is much, much higher. So mm -hmm. it's, it's non-trivial. I mean, we can put RFID tags on and scan them on the store shelf and then update on hand quantities all day long. That's no problem, but being able to compare what's happening point to point and trace that all the way through is, is quite challenging. And I think that, um, you know, that's what the chip project was that you mentioned is how we put systems in place to where we can trust and transfer that data from partner to partner in the full supply chain. And we're not quite there yet. Honestly, um, the biggest part of the problem with RFID is not the physics issues. And we said this earlier in the conversation, this is all an accounting problem, right? So this is all about how do we move from quantity level, SKU level accounting into serialized unit level accounting for full supply chain traceability. And that's probably one of the biggest IT changes that we've had in retail and supply chain since people started using computer databases in the 80s. That's going to take a long time to do. It's going to be huge. Um, so that's where we're heading. Yeah, Bridget, and I'm not sure if you you understand the, the technology he just mentioned, but today we have an item. I got this item right here. It has a UPC, and the store says I have a quantity of five. In the future, this has a UPC of whatever, and I've got serial number one, two, three, four, five. So each one, almost like the VIN number in your car, you have a unique serial number for every selling unit. The, the future potential is when you put your items in a box headed to Walmart or any other retailer, you know the exact serial number of every one that you put it in the box. When they receive it, they receive it and they read those tags. If they got them all, you're good. And if you didn't get them all, go, when they left our shipment facility, they were all there. So you need to check with your shipper because we have we have actual proof that it was there. That's the whole opportunity for claims elimination, right? Um, completely different question, but I think it's an important. JW from Barcoding is asking, um, are there opportunities for solution providers to partner with Auburn when working with customers who are re uh, re responsing for supplier compliance. They're looking for ways to strengthen industry alignment and increase adoption and successful implementation of for organizations that want to take on RFID uh, off of their internal organizations. You guys, you guys already do that. You're already working on behalf for the most part of the retailers. Is there anything else that can be done? Uh, is there any help that solution providers can provide? So, Yes, we do some of that. Well, we do partner with solution providers on a few different projects. Typically, we do that on a per project basis or directly with the suppliers themselves. Um, and mainly that's a volume issue. There's just so many. I mean, there's if you, you talked about a pyramid earlier, when you talk about RFID tags, you know, there's a few companies that make chips. There's a quite a few more that make inlays. But when you get down to the label level, it's a vast sea of, of suppliers out there. And it's very hard to figure out who all those solution providers are and who their partner bases are and who they're working with on the retail side. So our goal as a lab, and this is what a strategy that we chose long ago, Dr. Hargrave chose this before us, is we focus on the end users. So we spend all of our time that we can making sure that the retailers and the retail brands have the tools that they need to grow and drive adoption. We partner with solution providers as much as possible to get there, but our focus has not been as much on developing uh, tools or developing market. We don't do a lot of going out there and doing market analysis for solution providers or VC funds and things like that. We're focusing more on the end users themselves. So as much as we have partnership on projects with them on that, absolutely. Uh, but um, it's not a, uh, a standalone um, a project path normally for us. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, when it comes to partnering solution providers with the actual Auburn lab, specifically potentially providing solutions for your lab, that, that you do. I mean, you believe you have sponsorship opportunities for solution providers if they want to be become part of the Auburn lab, right? 
We do. We have an advisory board for the lab that we've had for since the beginning. Mike, you've been on that thing for how long? A long time. Um, so 20 years. <laughs> it's 20 years. The, the advisory board has been, uh, um, it's changed a lot. You know, um, the advisory board is truly an advisory board. So it's a group of companies that get together. And typically they're folks that are interested in industry development as a whole. There's a lot of competitors on there. Um, but um, we do have opportunities for folks that, that partner on that advisory board for, especially for research projects and stuff. Um, one of the biggest changes we've seen, and I think everybody has uh, since COVID is, it used to be we would come together like four times a year and you'd have a big group for a room full of people. And it's almost like a little mini conference. Um, now it's a lot more challenging to uh, facilitate collaboration and conversation. I think sometimes because zoom meetings and stuff are awesome, but you know, you don't get the side context. I think a lot of times that you would from there's things, especially the end users cannot say that I hear this all the time. Like, I would be happy to say this in a room full of people, but I will never say this online because I don't know who's recording. So it's really kind of limited some of the sharing that we've seen as an industry. And I don't mean this in a bad way. I'm just saying that the board is changing. So uh, um, there's definitely opportunities for that advisory board uh, uh, model. Uh, but we're, we're always looking for folks who are interested in, in long term growth and uh, um, overall uh, market development. Awesome. Perfect. And then I, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. The the next opportunity uh, to actually meet, I believe, is going to be September 14th at Cape Canaveral. It's going to be a, a, a both a aviation, aerospace, and retail. Uh, maybe a, maybe a shameless plug for that if anybody's interested in, in potentially attending that. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, Aero ID Summit. I think there's some spots left. Uh, uh, so that's in uh, the Kennedy Space Center. We're doing some work with NASA. The director of deep space logistics is going to come speak. Uh, we got speakers from McDonald's and Walmart. Um, we've got folks from Boeing. We got folks from Delta. I mean, it's a, a whole crew. So um, a lot of the problems that aviation and space are having translate immediately into opportunities for for retail. As a public university, all this money that me and you and everybody else are investing as taxpayers into NASA is great. But like, if they're going to put RFID on the space station, which they have. The idea is to transfer that technology down here into use for warehouses and stores. So uh, there's a little bit of a conversation about what they want, but then there's a lot of conversation about what's going to happen on the retail side. So if y'all are interested, come on. The AeroIDSummit.com is the, the website. You can register. It's free to come. And uh, I'd love to see y'all down there if you'd like to show up. Awesome. Perfect. Uh, I'm getting several questions on here that look like more like asset protection, return fraud, et cetera. Uh, since a lot of questions, we don't have time to cover all of these, I'm afraid. Um, I'm glad you, I'm loving you're there asking the questions. I'll do a shameless plug. The next uh, conversations on retail that Matt and Pfeiffer and I are going to be doing is September the 6th. I can't remember what time it is, uh, sometime in the morning, I think. Uh, and it's going to be with, I think, the industry leader about RFID in asset protection, Joe Cole, and a guy by the name of Randy Dunn, who is with Zebra Corporation. So I would encourage you guys to sign up for that one. We're going to go deep, and it's going to be all things asset protection, loss prevention as it relates to RFID. Uh, just, just, just so you know, we, I'm getting another uh, con a question around. This is an RFID for retail, but they would be very interested in hearing more about RFID possibility in general contracting building for international retail, uh, specifically remodeling re reconstruction sites for G where GPS may not make sense, but RFID could. So plant that seed for what it's worth. Um, we got about five minutes left. I want to I want to be sensitive and make sure that we start uh, started on time and stop on time. We'll actually stop a couple minutes early. Uh, here's, I guess, a couple. And by the way, I got through about four of the questions that I put together for these guys. Great answers and great questions coming from the audience. So thank you for that. But I think the one thing that I, that I see, and there's two, okay, Matthew, I'm going to jump to you and say, what is your vision for RFID in retail? I mean, you're you're obviously fairly new in this space, but you are the guy who Justin's tapped on the shoulder and say, you own RFID at retail. So versus where we are today, where do you see this thing going two to three to four years from now? I think it's it goes beyond just RFID in the future. I think, like Justin said earlier, it really is the shift to serialized data as a whole, um, and and that requires a complete overhaul of of the existing systems. You know, it's an accounting thing of moving towards individual units, um, and so I think that's that's going to change. And you know, I don't even think we've talked about serialized checkout yet, but um, when we move towards that, 
you know, being able to identify on the individual level when we're selling units um, and then having those leave the stores, I think that also opens up uh, opportunities for asset protection. And, and like you said earlier, not just identifying, you know, what we need to correct, but also what's causing that. Um, I, I think from an RFID perspective, that's where we're going to begin to look um, is not just what do we have in our stores? How do we count that? But looking farther upstream and then looking um, downstream at a shrink and then beginning to, to be proactive there. Um, so from my end, that's that's where I feel like RFID is, is going to move, you know, looking at fixed infrastructure solutions, um, looking at DCs, uh, manufacturing, uh, exits from stores, uh, choke points there that we can capture and, and use more data rather than just, you know, identifying what do we have in the store all the way at the end of the supply chain. All right, we'll put you on the spot. Do you see a day where between RFID and computer vision, I can have a seamless checkout experience that doesn't make me go through a register? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I think it, it depends, like depends on the product. Uh, I think there's a lot of variables, but I know that there are a lot of retailers now that are, are working and looking at solutions like that. And I think yep. we, Saw that start with with Amazon kind of yep. lighting that fire with the the ghost stores, but now it's you know there's a, there's plenty of retailers out there that you know, I know are exploring uh, different options like that. So yeah, I mean I wouldn't be surprised if it if it did become something uh, in the future. Gotcha, gotcha. Thank you. And question for you, Justin. Um, anything that I didn't ask that's hot on your mind when it comes to RFID retail, what did I not ask that I should have asked? I mean, what's, what's the burning things that are going on and you're hearing conversations again, no confidential data should be shared, but what are the things that are on people's minds that haven't come up in this conversation? The biggest topic in retail supply chain now in the future. And the biggest thing for RFID is 2d barcodes. Mm -hmm. Like the future of RFID weird as it is to say, is 2D barcode or 2D data matrix. We are about to, as an industry, whether everybody wants to or not, shift to serialized unit level tracking at the barcode for checkout. Uh, yeah. UPC barcodes, the 1D barcodes, G10s are on their way out. And we've already seen a few retailers get there. Uh, you've got some folks like H&M, uh, Adidas, and Nike, and some of the others that are really pushing that way. Uh, but GS1 has a major initiative for 2027 uh, to try to get everybody over there. A lot of the retailers have already done national studies on whether they have imagers that are capable of capturing a 2D barcode or 2D data matrix for checkout systems. And um, for brands and brand manufacturers, that's a big responsibility shift. It's not just RFID tags on these things that are serialized. They will have to put a serialized barcode on all those units, and it will be reconciled back with the RFID tags on there. We've already been down this road with some other industries like aviation, and um, that is going to be uh, on the retailer side. It is a massive change in their data handling. I mean, you're talking about restructuring the entire inventory management systems of all of their warehouses, all of their retail stores. The smaller retailers are going to be a little bit more flexible well, and agile, and I think they're going to get there faster. The bigger retailers, it's going to take them a while. So if you're working for a retailer brand and you do not have a team already in place that's focused on, on serialized inventory or 2D barcodes or at least one person, I would be very concerned because you're, you're, you're about to get left behind because what happens is once we move to those serialized accounting systems, all the rest of this stuff just begins easy. The, the biggest problem that we have in retail is the approximations that happen when we move to quantity accounting. Yeah. That changes the annual financial auditing. It changes the cycle count process. It changes the claims conversation, shrink, everything. Like it'll be the probably we won't even recognize what retail supply chain as an industry looks like in 10 to 15 years. Um, and that's the thing that's the most exciting to be a part of, but uh, it's all, you know, it and accounting at this point, just making sure they get their stuff ready and get in place. But it's weird after 15 or 18, almost 20 years, the future of RFID is, is barcode, but, but it is, that's where it's going. Well, two, two things for you real quick. Number one, uh, we did a podcast with Synthal, who's part of the RFID lab, and Myron Burke, and I think Jonathan Greger from GS1. It's out there on the conversa conversations at retail site. And the name of it was the ID in RFID, because ID the ID is the data part. And it can be radio frequency identification, or it could be a barcode. It doesn't have to be. And so it's the serialized portion. Go back and check that out if you're interested. If you're uh, The second thing is, 
the 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 procedure or the direction that GS1 has taken just google sunset 2027 that's the that's the acronym that they've used and that's that will help to, to provide people that information maybe justin we ought to get on up what did, did i say it wrong sunrise so sunrise. <laughs> so hey i did the really? same thing oh they get so annoyed uh, I, I called it sunset 2027 and i was like no 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 we're not sunsetting we're sunrising uh, it's a it's a uh, it's a optimist Mar pessimist thing. okay so i just made the gs1 marketing people mad but they'll get over it um yeah it's the same idea though it's actually everything is going to be serialized item whether it's rfid or not uh maybe justin you and i and jonathan jump on a podcast at some point in time to help help the industry out well i'm going to wrap this thing up we got about four minutes left just matthew thank you welcome um, you know, you're going to take this farther than, than we've been able to take it in the 20 years. When you finish out your career, you'll be able to say, I remember talking about Justin and with Mike about, you know, maybe one of these days we could use this for asset protection purposes. So you, you're, you're coming in just at the right time. We appreciate that. And Justin, just for you, you and I have been working together for 20 years. It, it has been fun. It has been challenging, but there's never been a boring moment. There's always stuff going on in this space. And, and I appreciate your friendship and I appreciate that. The one thing I did, did want to mention, we are, we are going to be kicking off an on-hand accuracy study. I want to do a shameless plug. Justin is working with Matthew uh, and but what I call the academic dream team, uh, Dr. Bill Hargrave from the University of Memphis, uh, Dr. Uh, Glenn Ritchie from Supply Chain at Auburn, and Dr. Matt Waller from the University of Arkansas. We're going to go work with some retailers to be announced yet to measure the impact of on-hand accuracy to sales. Very specifically, if I change my on-hand from 55 to 60, what is the impact of sales? Because everybody assumes it's a good thing, but I don't think we have any empirical evidence. So just more to follow on that. Uh, but Justin, Matthew, thank you very much for your time. Y'all have a great weekend, safe drive to Atlanta. And uh, thank you everybody for uh, participating in today's call. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Talk to you soon. Wait. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with the Auburn RFID Lab. Join us next time as we have another special guest to talk about RFID and asset protection. Join me as we welcome Joe Cole, who is the Vice President of Asset Protection for the Macy's Corporation. He'll be talking about how he's leveraging RFID and other technologies for the asset protection space at Macy's. See you then.